Hi everybody and welcome to the Art of Estate Planning Facebook Live. Now I am joined by our special guest Michael Miller and Michael is actually our first repeat guest. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today Michael. No, uh, yeah, thank you for having me again. Oh, it's our pleasure. You did such a great job last time. So um, today, Michael is coming on to talk to us about granny flat agreements, which is something I'm really interested in. I personally have no experience in granny flat agreements and arrangements. I've always kind of just dodged it or referred it on. So I'm really interested in this one. Before we dive into the technical topic, Michael, for the people who aren't familiar with you, and I have to say, I'm pretty sure most people will be familiar with you because you are a super user in the Facebook group and a prolific um, answerer of questions. So I'm sure some people who um, are watching will have seen you pop up from time to time. But if they're not really sure about where you're based or what you do, would you mind letting everybody know a little bit about your business? Um, yeah, absolutely. So I run a practice uh, based in Canberra uh, with Wealth Market. Uh, I've been running that for about the last eight years now. Um, and uh, I think what we do a lot of work with here um, locally and then sort of increasingly uh, sort of across Australia uh, is in particular um, family and estate lawyers. Uh, and, and part of that is I'm actually sort of quite interested in the social security rules, uh, which obviously uh, relate to people's age pension type entitlements, but that also flows a lot into um, things like retirement villages and, and residential aged care uh, as, as well. So, um, yeah, I, I'm always sort of interested in how that applies and, and, and that's where some of the, uh, the granny flat uh, agreements and arrangements sort of came into it. Um, well, it, I mean, I, we've seen the kind of answers and um, contributions that you're making in the group, and you've certainly got a very wide breadth of knowledge in terms of those issues. So um, we might have to pick your brain again and have you back on another time. Um, in the meantime, let's focus on the granny flood agreements. So I'll just let everybody know, uh, Michael has generously shared his presentation slides. I uploaded them in the group yesterday. So you should be able to see those, just search granny flat if you can't easily find them. And Michael has also agreed to take some questions. So please feel free to put your questions in the comments box as we go. Uh, we'll try to answer them at a sensible juncture throughout the presentation and also we'll leave time at the end. Um, I would just say if you've got a question, feel free to put it in because sometimes there is a bit of a delay and we don't see your question until after we've logged off. So if you would like us to answer it live, feel free to pop it in. And thank you to everybody who has joined us live already. Adele, thanks for saying hello and letting us know the technology is working. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand over to Michael to get into the nitty gritty of the granny flat agreements. Uh, thanks, Tara. Uh -huh. um, we of course start with uh, the, the disclaimer, which you know, we're, we're going to talk about a lot of facts and figures um, today. Also general advice, which is you know, how rules might work and things that might be considered. Uh, what we won't be covering is uh, personal advice, which you know, really takes into account an individual's uh, circumstances. Part of that is obviously, uh, you know, we're not talking about any individuals uh, today, um, but also I try to sort of creatively word our disclaimer. Um, I'm in the business of giving people personal advice when they uh, would like it and would need it. So if that is what they need, then the best thing they can do um, is you know, give us a call or, or send us an email. Um, so I, I thought it would be worth starting e even just with this little uh, explanation of what, what I call the care and living sort of ecosystem um, outside of family type arrangements. And I, I think it's actually, it's relatively important to understand when people are talking about these granny flat agreements, what other opportunities they have um, and, and what might be out there that they might need sort of in the future. Uh, because I've sort of used the example is you wouldn't sort of put somebody into a residential aged care facility that didn't have qualified nurses. So if somebody, if a client is talking to you about granny flat agreements, we probably want to just make sure that they don't actually 
need a sort or type of care that you know, they're not able to get from their family, that they actually need something else within that um, you know, ecosystem. So what you have is it's this interesting combination of uh, you know, Commonwealth systems, but then also state and territories, um, because all the retirement villages, of course, are, um, are covered under state and territory legislation. But you've also then got your residential aged care, which is Commonwealth. You've got the in-home care system, which is also Commonwealth. But more and more what we see is, is these systems are actually all uh, very interlinked. Um, a lot of in-home care is delivered by the same organisations that are running um, residential aged care facilities uh, and, and particularly with retirement villages is they're, they're now um, using in-home care services to really um, be able to deliver a higher and integrated level of care um, to people who actually reside in those retirement villages. Um, it's also important, of course, because particularly with retirement villages and residential aged care, what what we you see sometimes is an operator actually has both of those and they will be physically side by side on the same campus. Um, you know, a client doesn't necessarily ha have an understanding of you know what the difference is. They just know they you know, they're going to um, a, a, a large sort of Canberra local one is a, an organisation called Goodwin um, you know, that they run on the same sort of campus, retirement villages and residential aged care. Most people just sort of say, well, I'm going to Goodwin. They don't necessarily say, I'm going to the Goodwin Retirement Village or I'm going into the residential aged care run uh, by Goodwin. So that's sort of the, I think this system that the Granny Flat Agreements uh, exists within and alongside. Um, I think there's four sort of components that really exist with the, the granny flat and care agreements. There's the social security rules, uh, and, and that's what we're going to sort of talk a little bit about today. Um, they've actually been in place for quite some time. They're not um, new, um, but then uh, the, these agreements uh, you know, also need to cover, well, what are the rights and the obligations of uh, you know, the, the parties that are involved because everybody has um, all of those. Uh, and, and I'm going to talk very, very briefly about tax uh, and that's because it's, it's historically been quite substantially uh, important uh, to, to the agreements and, and quite a hurdle, um, but that's what's actually changed recently is there has been an announcement uh, about tax treatment. Um, it, it hasn't been legislated yet. Um, but very briefly, what, what's existed in the past, uh, and it's not always been very widely known, is there's quite a substantial uh, capital gains tax hurdle um, for granny flat agreements. What the existing law says, and I've got a bit of an example here, um, is if your mum moves in with her son and daughter-in-law, gives $200,000 to them, um, to build a granny flat on an existing property uh, and, and you know, their, their sort of solicitors do what is quite sensible and say, well, let's, you know, we should make an agreement about what's going to happen you know, with this money, people's rights and obligations. Um, current tax law treats that as uh, the son and daughter in law have just sold mum a bundle of rights for $200,000. So... Uh, I don't know that they were widely doing it because tax is a self-assessment system, but, but strictly speaking under the rules, um, that meant that son and daughter-in-law had $100,000 uh, taxable income from that transaction to declare. Um, so this is where, to be frank, granny flat agreements haven't been a huge feature because if you were aware of the tax problem, uh, as a financial planner, as, a, as an estate planning or conveyancing solicitor, the only thing you could really do was say, guys, you can't do this uh, unless you're prepared to cop the tax bill, uh, which you know, on the numbers most people are looking at, that pretty much ended the, the whole discussion. Uh, now, what has happened, none of it's been legislated yet, but there was 
uh, an announcement by the, uh, the Treasurer in, a couple of weeks ago saying, uh, look, we are actually going to legislate to fix this uh, by 1st of July 2021. Um, and that was based off a review that the Board of Taxation did uh, and, and is available on their website, the link is there, uh, into this whole issue of the, the tax hurdle. Uh, and, and what they've done, once again, it's, it's not legislated, but you can look at that report, they've, they've actually done a really outstanding job uh, because they have looked at that, that tax hurdle that has been identified and said, well, right, what do we need to do to fix that? But they've actually really systematically gone through and looked at, well, okay, if we're going to change this and fix that, what are all the other parts of the system that might be affected? So, you know, for example, in the example we've got there, um, the, the son and the daughter-in-law would normally have a main residence exemption from capital gains tax. That a granny flat agreement, if you get rid of that first tax hurdle, well, the question then becomes is, do they lose their, um, you know, their main residence exemption or partially lose it? Once again, it hasn't been legislated, so you can't see what they're necessarily going to do. But in that Board of Taxation report, you can see that they, they're very alive to that there's this whole bunch of issues that come after that. That So, so I think what you'd expect is when they do legislate for this, it's, it's going to give a lot of clarity around um, those other sort of follow on issues. Um, so, so, yeah, that, that's, that's the big change in that if you've been aware of the tax issue, you've really just mostly been telling people to sort of stop, do not pass go. Um, it, it will now actually be um, something that, that is quite important. Uh, even I think within the Board of Taxation Review, uh, it seems like that, that there's probably a good chance that it may actually even be compulsory to um, have a written agreement to uh, obtain the various tax concessions. So, so that you know, that potentially also drives the inquiries from people who are thinking about doing this to their solicitors to say, well, hey, um, actually, I'm, I'm broadly aware of this thing. I know that I want the concessions. Uh, so you know, let's talk about an agreement. And that's obviously where uh, you know, a number of the members of the group here sort of would, would be getting those inquiries and then working out, well, okay, what, what should we be doing in terms of these agreements? Um, a lot of the drivers are around those social security concessions that, that do exist, which is you know, for people in this cohort, normally the, the older person who's looking to move into or make some sort of granny flat arrangement, uh, it's, it's often to, uh, you know, they're often in receipt of an age pension and the like there, and that's quite uh, significant to them. So, for example, I've just got the, the rates as they stand at the moment, the full pension for a single person, about $24,500 a year, uh, and for a couple, $37,000 a year. Um, now, those are means tested where they look at the assets and the income of the people receiving that pension. So they may not actually receive the full pension amount, um, but one of the big concessions in that system is if you own your own home, uh, that's that's completely excluded uh, from the asset testing. Um, so when people are looking at these granny flat type agreements, um, you know, the naming is a bit funny. It's sort of just come out of the, the very sort of traditional, you know, they, they may actually be named something else by the time they get all these care agreements through because uh, you know, it doesn't need to be a granny, can be a grandpa. Uh, of interest, they've also spoken about the concession being available for people with disabilities. So it may actually uh, you know, go the other way generationally too for people who have um, children with disabilities. Um, but but there is often this uh, sort of age pension type influence, um, and, and it may be where you know they're looking at uh, sort of transferring their own house to the next generation as part of the agreement and having them moving into the house or it might be selling to build something on, on you know, children's property or it could be selling and then they're sort of pulling money to buy something that's suitable um, well not together because the in this instance the, uh, the the older person wouldn't be on the title but they might be contributing a, a substantial amount of that purchase price. Um, 
So, Michael, can I interrupt you? Yeah. Sorry, and um, I hope this is an appropriate juncture before we dive into social security. Adele has asked a question just to clarify around the CGT treatment. So she's asked, would capital gains tax come into play without an actual agreement in place? And use an example of an Italian family building a granny flat in their backyard for Nonna, who's paid for the build. So I guess, yeah, I suppose the question is, does having an agreement in place solve the current CGT issues or D1 applies regardless of whether the agreement and the agreement's just for like contractual rights? Yeah, so, so <laughs> it, that, that's actually a, a really uh, smart and interesting question. Um, but because of course, you'd know that an agreement doesn't have to be in writing to exist as an agreement. Yeah. Um, so so there, there is that element to the, the tax uh, the tax law. Um, uh, now, if the agreement is is not in writing, um, you know, it may be hard, to, say, for the proverbial tax office to sort of you know, come after the you know, the Italian nonna in that scenario and say, well, you definitely had an agreement if there's nothing in writing. Um, but when you start to blend it with the social security uh, side of it, is if that was relevant um, in that scenario, Nona has probably gone off to Centrelink and said, no, actually, I have an agreement. Uh, I would like the concessions. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, so so th this is where I, um, and, and uh, you know, I and some other people were involved in um, uh, sort of pointing out the issue to the, the Board of Taxation and, and then sort of testing the edges of where that was is, and one of the things we spoke about is it's, it's from a government perspective, probably a real win-win uh, because Yes, I suspect there were people out there making those agreements uh, to a certain degree of formality or not, um, but the tax office wasn't chasing them. Um, you know, they didn't know to report it. Uh, so uh, it, the, the, the only real practical effect was, of course, for us as you know, professionals providing advice, um, you know, there's no way we could ever give anybody advice saying, I'll oh, make the agreement, just don't tell the tax office um, and it'll be okay. Um, you know, yeah. In practice, I don't think the tax office was actually sort of uh, finding out about any of these these things or, or the like. Um, so, but yeah, it, it it didn't necessarily solve the, the tax problem. But uh, yeah, there probably weren't a lot of people reporting their tax liability in that scenario. Okay, so um, an agreement will not save you from the tax position, and a lack of agreement is just non-disclosure which is against our self-disclosure reporting obligations and the tax is the tax is the tax. I have to say, without having ever looked at this, I just assumed that the principal place of residence exemption applied on the creation of the D1, so it was fine, but obviously it doesn't, so that's um, something new. Yeah, no, very specifically doesn't apply to yeah. that capital gains tax event. The um, but yeah, you. If if there was more than ten of these D one events sort of ever reported to the tax office, I, I would honestly be very surprised. <laughs> um, I don't I don't think anybody really had to sit there in the ta at the tax office and work out, oh, we're giving up a whole bunch of tax if this sort of amendment gets through. Um, you know, I, th I think it was sort of more that oh, actually, uh, you know, we weren't collecting any. We'll go to not collecting any, but and now now we sort of. Uh, yeah, we don't have to go after, you know, as you said, the 85-year-old Italian nonna for um, you know, non-disclosure or, or the like there. Or, or yes. Yeah. The children's problem. But the... Yeah. I mean, and that's, I mean, they, they, I think from a public policy perspective, granny flats are in the public interest, right? So... I think, I think they are, but the, the potential for... Um, I guess elder abuse at one end of the spectrum mm. where people are really deliberately doing the wrong thing, but probably more um, yeah, the, the the issue with the sort of unspecified, undocumented type agreements was if there was a dispute, there was virtually no mechanism to resolve that other than going to court. That was very expensive. Um, the and, and and once again, we we're often sort of talking about not formal agreements. Um, so so they're, they're, 
and they very much considered this in the report, is getting into a sort of formal-ish system uh, where people are considering their rights and obligations and you know, what might go wrong and, and how might we exit these things uh, is actually quite good. Um, because I would also say that probably a lot of my experience is people who are thinking about these types of arrangements, and obviously when you're talking about being concerned with social security, uh, means that you know if we're talking about a, a family where you know both generations are worth let's just say two million dollars of net worth well they were never eligible for the social security benefits anyway um so they might just be doing sort of co-ownership but but also might have the means to uh you know do these sorts of things themselves without having this sort of cross ownership a lot of what you do see in this uh, sort of space is where um you know, you might have, say, obviously depends on which sort of market you are in, in Australia, but say in, in, in Canberra, to get a standalone house, say, with enough room to, you know, have multiple generations, you're starting to look probably at least $700,000 and closer to $900,000 type purchase price. Um, what you would often see is, is it might be a case of, well, the younger generation could borrow some of that with a contribution from the older generation to sort of just get there. It was it was very rarely a case of, well, we've got a million bucks in cash and we're just buying with that. So, so it was sort of the people who couldn't afford to go through expensive dispute resolution as well. Uh, I mean, that's the difficulty with these arrangements is, the informal nature and the optimism that the family brings into the agreement. And then also, what do you do when it goes pear-shaped? Because, um, you know, you, you're litigating your own family mm. and, yeah, who's usually they don't even have enough spare money, you know, to go through that process. So it, it's incredibly difficult if things don't go according to the initial plan, isn't it? Well, that, that, that's right, and that's where I, I think a big part of the role in, in sort of you know, advising on these agreements at the start is going to be in that, um, you know, the combination of these are the ways it can go wrong and we need to have plans for it, but also to just, um, you know, th these are the, um, you know, the natural changes that may occur. Um, so, so we've certainly sort of got some content there because I, I do think there's, there's going to... Um, yeah, you know, I think the work that, uh, and and I don't know exactly, but I suspect this might, it might you know, people practising in estates uh, and, you know, who would be drafting wills and things like that is probably where these agreements naturally go to be sorted. Um, the actual drafting of the agreement, I think, will be that small part of the job. Uh, it will actually be, um, you know, getting people to think about what should be in that agreement? What are the scenarios that we should expect, you know, can or might happen throughout that? Um, and are we prepared to accept what comes with that, uh, you know, as we go into it? Because they're, la they're, they're normally large, substantial property transactions. And as you said, family, uh, people, that they're, you, they're not small or short-term agreements. So you really do need to have thought, thought it through quite seriously before you actually... Um, you know, en enter into it. It's not the same as you know, doing conveyancing on a three-bedroom townhouse where if two years down the track, you know, that wasn't the right property for you or whatever it is, we'll just sort of put it back on the market and sure, we might pay a bit in sort of sale costs and, and the like there, but we can sort of get in and out relatively easily. Um, these are uh, easy to get into, probably much harder to get out of. Um, yeah. So there's some importance in thinking about that before you get into it. And the problem that I've always seen whenever these types of um, arrangements have been discussed is the agreement is really not that, not worth the paper it's written on if it's not enforceable. And to enforce what's written down often requires, you know, suing your next of kin and yeah. need having the funds on both sides. You know, if, if they've contributed like, if granny or whoever it is has contributed like all their money or their savings into the mm. property, like, and then the, you're trying to um, get compensation for a breach of 
contract. There's no, there's no money available other than what you've already, you know, it's just like not easy to enforce. So the agreement in my mind, I think it's useful having one and setting out the expectations at the beginning before the arrangement is um, implemented so that you can check if you're on the same page or not. But often, you know, some people think, oh, well, we'll just have an agreement and that will protect us. And I don't know if that is the case in a practical sense. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, uh, spot on. The, uh, getting out of them is difficult. Um, and, and, and I don't think there's anything that you can put in the agreement that will change that. So that's where I... Yeah. I mean, I don't think I don't think the real work is in putting the clauses in the you know the the agreement that allows them to enforce. It's actually in sitting down there and say saying you know, okay, have you thought about in fifteen years time, let's say, um, you know, the only what you might make this agreement on how we get out of it, and and that's um, that's fine. But have you thought about that? Likely, the only way you do that is you know sell a property or or something like that. You know. Um, they, they, I don't think they should be entered into lightly. Um, the so, so there is that huge role in, in just you know, really sort of getting people to picture and accept you know, the, this is this is a, a big deal. Um, and once yeah. again, coming back to that, what else exists in the ecosystem is are there alternatives to this? Um, and and you know what are the uh, yeah, those alternatives will probably have their own drawbacks, but if you weigh that up, uh, it might be worthwhile. Um, you know, what, one of the things, uh, particularly given the tax hurdle has been there, is I've always said, you know, can somebody just buy an apartment that's actually near, you know, quite close by the house and, and get somewhat of the same effect that you're after um, without having to, you know, blend uh, you know, different generations' assets and, and things like that. Um, yeah, I, I think it will it will be about talking about what's involved in those agreements and just sort of saying, hey, have you actually thought about you know what what are you what are yeah. you trying to achieve here and are there alternatives to uh, getting getting towards that and and sort of weighing the different options there? Uh, well, thank you for answering that and sorry we've taken you off tangent, Michael. Great question, Adele. Very thought provoking. Yeah, no, okay, and I, I think all, all we've done is uh, that will probably just make another section that we've got uh, coming a, a little bit more brief because we've probably covered some oh. of the ground there. So it, it, it's certainly something that is really um, yeah, worth, worth thinking about. The, um, so uh, I, I'm, I'm always, a, a, I'm not a very believing person. Uh, so when somebody says an exemption exists or something like that, uh, I always want to know well, what's, yeah where is that in sort of precedent or in statute or, or things like that. Um, so I've got a very sort of brief rundown that what happens on the social security side is uh, a granny fight is what's uh, considered a, a special residence in social security rules. Um, and, you know, largely talks about where uh, somebody is living in a home that they don't necessarily actually own, but they've given consideration for you know, a right uh, to reside for their lifetime or yeah, some sort of life interest in the residence. What this is practically doing is just extending that uh, yeah, exemption for uh, yeah, the principal home to these other types of arrangements that aren't actually the same ownership interest. So uh, retirement villages, the ingoing contribution there are also considered a special residence um, in the, the same way. Um, if there is this concept of what's called the extra allowable amount, uh, I'll sort of cover where it comes from. It's about $214,000. If a person is paying over less than that, then um, they're actually considered more like a renter than a homeowner. Um, I think, you know, just looking at you know, construction costs uh, and, and general sort of home uh, prices, you probably more, you know, nine out of 10 of these agreements are going to be scenarios where we're in this territory of it's above that extra allowable amount of the $214,000. Um, um, and, and so that that's exempt from the asset testing. Um, the it, it's, it's a little bit interesting the way the sort of uh, rules exist here because you have what's called uh, a reasonableness test. And that's 
that's basically trying to say, well, what has um, you know the older person sort of handed over in return for their uh, you know that that interest in a residence that they now have, um, and and how much of the exemption applies to that, and you've got these sort of side by side rules in a way because um, the entry contribution, so what they paid, um, what the rules actually say is that well, it's it's um, the value of that is is just uh, what they've paid or what they've transferred. So um, if the way your granny flight agreement comes to be is it's actually that um, you know the the older person was in the sort of the five bedroom house that they'd raised the family in, um, yeah, and it was just too large for them now. Uh, and what they actually did was transfer that to their children, who then moved in with the older person. Um, uh, then the value of that is just the value of the property. Um, and whether that property was valued at um, you know, $800,000 or $1.7 million, um, it doesn't really matter. That gets the exemption. Uh, as soon as you move away from that sort of direct transfer, though, you get into what's called this reasonableness test. Uh, so, so in that scenario, if it's, well, I transfer the house plus I give $100,000, now you've moved away from, well, what was that house actually worth and, and into this reasonableness test. And, and what that's, I think, trying to get at uh, is there are within Social Security what's called deprivation rules, which basically says, well, you can give money away to you know, your children or somebody else. Um, we don't stop you from doing that with the Social Security rules, but we will treat it as still being yours for another five years. So there are some small exemptions, but very broadly, if a parent gives $200,000 to their child and then goes and applies for the age pension for the purpose of assessing that, that older person's age pension entitlement, they will treat that $200,000 as being there um, for another five years. So it's it's prevents that sort of, well, I'll just give all my money away and rock up and, and uh, you know, be eligible for the full age pension, even if I actually sort of had a substantial amount of wealth anyway. Um, so what this reasonableness test does is it takes the combined annual partnered pension rate. So that was the one that you might recall, we went back to about $37,000 a year, and multiplies it by a conversion factor, um, which is basically just a proxy for life expectancy. Um, so it's a little bit small on my screen, but I think at uh, 51 there, it sort of starts at about 33 and you know, gets down to about 2.6 at the age of 100. Um, and, and if it is a couple, it works off uh, the younger uh, member of the couple. And if you multiply that into amounts, it basically means that this reasonableness test for somebody who's 51 it can be a bit over $1.2 million there. So you can transfer, you know, if you sold the house, you transfer $1.2 million. I mean, I don't think there's a lot of 51 year olds entering into granny flight agreements, but in theory, um, you can transfer $1.2 million and that will be uh, you know, not counted like you've given that money away for the purposes of your entitlement. Whereas if you're 100, you know, that figure is going to be much more like uh, you know, about 80 ish sort of. 80 to 95 thousand dollars you can't sort of give away 1.2 million dollars and pretend you know um, I was reasonably expected to live in that property for the next 30 years until I was 129 um, so so and and they're all sort of set down in in the rules there um, and and this is just how the age pension the asset testing works and why this is uh, you know relevant to a lot of people. Uh, is if we look at a couple who own um, their own home, um, once they have over $401,500 of assets, their, their pension starts scaling down from that full rate of about $37,000 a year. Uh, and if they get to the $876,500, they've actually uh, lost, they don't have any more entitlement to the age pension while they're over that threshold. Um, so the difference between sort of one or two or three hundred thousand dollars being included in their assets or not included in their assets uh, can be quite substantial if they are uh, sort of you know, within those those bands in particular. The, 
Um, and this is just hi highlighting that that extra allowable amount, the 214,500, it's the difference between the homeowners and the non-homeowner thresholds that exist there. Um, for reference sake, I've got the income testing in there. Um, people are assessed on, on their income as well, but with these granny flat agreements, it's, it's much more likely to be the asset testing that actually impacts them. And, and a lot of that's because the deeming rates uh, on you know, money in the bank is quite low uh, because you know, interest on money in the bank is extremely low. There is a, a little bit of a rule about if people um, uh, you know, leave these arrangements. So remembering that if we sort of jump back a couple of slides, if we had somebody who was you know, the age of uh, you know, 65, the formula, and they're going into a gra granny care uh, arrangement, the formula sort of assumes about you know, 21 years is their life expectancy. So we expect this agreement to have at least something close to a 21 year lifetime. Um, so there are some, I'd say these are sort of protective provisions which say, you know, actually if the resident leaves that granny flat residence within five years, um, then, then a lot of those social security concessions can be undone. So you can't just sort of go, you know, go and set up the granny flat for two years as a really convenient way to pass money to the kids and not have it count under the social security rules. Um, so they, they talk about, um, you know, if it's within five years and probably the, the one thing that's a little bit important about this is they talk about factors that should have been foreseeable. Um, so, that, so they do actually give a bit of a list of things that um, may not have been foreseeable when some, somebody you know, suddenly becomes illness, a family relationship breakdown, your know, natural disaster and elder abuse. Uh, but if, for example, you sort of, after two years, you say, look, we're unwinding this, um, yeah, somebody's really sick uh, and that person already actually sort of had that illness or condition when you were entering into it, uh, there is the potential they say, well, no, that was foreseeable. You actually knew about that when you entered into the agreement. Uh, it's not a reason to be exiting it, but if it is uh, it's something new or a change, then then certainly, um, uh, you know, then, then that, that's sort of okay under the rules. Um, and I think I've sort of made a point there that, uh, well, the, these rules have these sort of circumstances that might change. It's actually a really good starting point for, well, these are the things we should actually be talking to clients about of, hey, have you thought about how this agreement would work if these things happened, if there was a family relationship breakdown, uh, you know, if somebody became you know, ill or injured, uh, if the, you know, the house was flooded, um, yeah, it's, it's a very good starting point uh, for that discussion. So, um, you know, this here, I guess, is, is my, uh, my, my attempt at, at starting to think about that, well, what are the things that we should be including in these agreements and in the discussions with clients? Because right now there isn't that much um, sort of guidance. So, so and I, I've, I've broken it down into sort of four categories, uh, you know, looking at, well, what happens when we enter this agreement at the start? What are the expectations throughout the life of the agreement? Um, what are the expectations at any point when the ag agreement or arrangement ends, uh, and then you know just a very sort of generic uh, what else? Um, so so this is a lot of sort of what flowed from Adele's question uh, earlier. You know, there, there's some very obvious ones on entry of just well, how much will somebody pay? You know, who will pay what money to who? When when will they actually do that? Uh, you know, if they're handing over money for a right to reside uh, in a property that they don't own, uh, you know, well what? actually putting that right to occupy in the agreement. Uh, yeah. W what's the impact that then has on their estate plans? You know, does there need to be equalization with other um, sort of beneficiaries? Um, I, I do think that uh, yeah, it may actually sort of end up when they make these reforms that there is a requirement for independent legal advice, but I, I do think yeah, regardless of whether it's actually a requirement, uh, yeah, eminently sensible, uh, because you do have two closely related parties uh, who will have you know, somewhat competing interests. Um, 
yeah, an agreement could be drafted that yeah, greatly favours the uh, you know the older person. Um, you could also just as much draft an agreement that greatly favours the um, you know the other generation and, and the like. There, the um, I've put a note there. Um, yeah, I, I think in some consultations uh, with um, you know, people with expertise in sort of conveyancing and things like that, that I don't know if these type of agreements where somebody doesn't actually have an interest in the title of the property itself, whether security, you know, being registered or caveats is actually possible. Um, but I think once again, I bring that back to, well, um, if it's not possible, it, it's giving that advice that it, it isn't possible and you know, you should be aware that you won't have any of these types of interests or securities that you might have otherwise had in other types of transactions. Um, you know, throughout the agreement, uh, you know, sometimes the, these granny flat uh, you know, arrangements, it might be purely a property and residency type transaction, um, but there may actually also be you know, expectations of uh, you know, care um, of sort of ongoing financial contributions. So, so even, you know, starting to think about does the property have separately metered utilities? Yeah. Is there a family internet connection? Uh, you know, does, um, does, Nan, does Nan get a login on Netflix? Um, yeah, all those sorts of things. Um, maybe Netflix is sort of getting a little bit too much into the weeds, but um, yeah, it sort of can, probably can and should be specified uh, within those uh, agreements and, and um, you know, maintenance and repair. Uh, if this thing goes for 15 or 20 years um, and something, you know, a roof needs repair, who's responsible for that? Does that depend on whether you actually have a separate granny flat or if it's actually just, um, you know, a large house with separate rooms, in which case the roof is combined? Um, you know, the, I think these sorts of things should be once again in the agreement and discussed about what's going in the agreement so people know what they're um agreeing to uh and and then you know when people are leaving questions of well if the property has gone up in value does that increase or decrease in value belong to the people who own the title does it belong partially to um you know the 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 other resident as as well um and you know i think this is where you're really starting to get into those meaty questions that that you're asking about well how how do we actually um you know we're, one we're making this agreement whatever it may be but what is the mechanism that the money for that agreement would actually come from you know are we talking about a, a forced property sale and um, so you know one of the sort of points that i've made there is uh retirement villages and their contracts um might actually be a sort of a useful starting point to sort of say well yeah this is how they structure things do we want to structure our our agreement in a similar way or do we not like their way we want to do something different it is a good sort of pointer uh, as to what sort of other people are doing um and then in that what else category i, I think yeah even as we spoke about the you know, a dispute resolution clause where do we go to start with because you know that, that i think that that has potential for two really good things um is one it might actually mean that um, you know disputes get resolved which is nice uh in, in a <laughs> in a way that everybody's happy with when they sort of you know have be it a mediator or somebody like that to sort of facilitate that um yeah or but also um you know that might be more cost effective than everybody sort of trundling off to to court if, if it can be resolved uh in that way um and then you know looking at the the things that might go wrong so the relationship breakdowns if the property is just no longer suitable you know once again putting that in the agreements, but then also having that discussion about, hey, this is something you really need to consider when you're entering uh, into this. Um, so this is just a very brief model of how retirement villages structure their agreements. Um, you know, as, as that reference is what you've typically got is an ingoing contribution where you pay a large um, you know, lump sum amount um, you've then got ongoing fees, which is a little bit like a body corporate, but normally a bit more expensive, which is covering your maintenance, some of the common utilities and things like that. Um, and what's common in a lot of retirement villages is you actually have, um, they call them you know, deferred management fees, or they're effectively exit fees where 
some of that ingoing contribution is surrendered for every year that the resident stays, you know, that might be appropriate, um, you know, I guess just depending on how you structure the agreement and what the financial side of who spent what money to you know, build things and things like that. Um, and once again, just making the point that you know, alternatives could be that there's actually, uh, you know, rather than this complicated sort of handing over capital, maybe a rental or lease type agreement is an alternative worth considering. Um, also just you know, very quickly how the, the residential aged care system works is there's a basic daily fee. Everybody pays an amount. Now this is more if you are looking at probably where there is substantial care provision as well as just accommodation, uh, but there is a basic daily fee. Um, there's also an accommodation payment, which can be a lump sum paid. Um, it's paid to the facility in aged care, uh, but is also returned to the estate of the person if they leave that aged care or if they pass away. So once again, that might be a model for, you know, you might have a granny flight agreement that says, um, you know, I'm handing over $300,000. Um, you know, the expectation is that if I pass away, um, you know, the property will be sold and that $300,000 will be returned to my estate. Um, there's nothing wrong with having an agreement that says that. Um, if everybody's aware of that's what they're you know, agreeing to uh, and, and entering into, um, look, you probably don't start getting into means tested fees for granny flat uh, arrangements. It's uh, pretty tough to sort of front up to, to mum or dad like Centrelink and say, tell us what you've got and, uh, and we'll charge you a fee accordingly. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, just, to, just as that sort of comparison there. Um, and I think the, this this comes. To, I think this is something that would be really important. Is I think the use of family conferencing. Um, you know, if you've if you've got your agreement, uh, and and when I talk about family conferencing, I mean particularly where there are um, you know if these are family agreements and there is other uh, you know say siblings who who may not be the ones sort of providing the the accommodation and, and things like that. Um, you know, you, you can write the best agreement in the world. Um, it's it's when something sort of happens in the future and you sort of put it up against the people um, that it can sort of fall over a little bit. Um, so I, I, I really think it would be great to see where these agreements are being made and there are sort of other family members you know, that, that you actually work out, well, who are those people? You know, gather, you know, get them together, talk about what's in that agreement and to be frank, talk about the financial transactions that are going on as well as part of that um, because I do think it's, it's the surprises that create the discontent. Um, I didn't know that 15 years ago, you know, mum gave you that money uh, and you know, didn't expect to get any of that back into the estate. That, that I think is the real risk that if you can actually, um, you know, have that discussion up front, I do think that's, uh, you know, I mean, good for obviously just everybody's well-being, but, but sort of good for the security of the agreement uh, in, in that not sort of, uh, you know, leading to sort of hurt feelings or missed expectations later. Um, so just to, I guess, put a bit of numbers around the, the rules here is, is what I've got is just a little bit of a, um, a, a case study of what uh, this looks like. So we've got here um, Fatima, who's age 68. Uh, and, and what I've done is uh, owned up here is that really I've just done this, uh, I've, I've taken a retirement village case study that I've done elsewhere and changed it into a granny flight agreement because uh, the work was already done. Yeah, if we're saying Fatima there has $650,000, she sold her home, that's in the bank. Got 50 grand as well in the separate bank account. That's her sort of emergency safety money. Also has uh, you know, money in a uh, superannuation pension that's paying her an income. Uh, and she's got just you know, furniture and a car and, and things like that. Has some living expenses and medical expenses. Um, and, and we've also sort of said, well, there's been an agreement that Fatima will contribute the $6,708 um, for the ongoing maintenance and utilities and things like that um, in the granny flat. And we're saying if Fatima is in there for five years, so she's met the, the requirement to be there for five years, um, yeah, not a lot of interest there, but obviously just the assumptions that are behind the, um, this case study is what we're looking at here is there might be two different ways that this um, 
sort of could be structured. Once again, I'm, I'm blatantly ripping off a, a retirement village structure here, um, but there could be one where there's a smaller contribution made at the start, um, but but there's a, a, a lesser sort of return of um, you know capital when the person leaves, or handing over more more at the start, um, but but not paying, not sort of losing as much of that on departure. So this is a quite common sort of retirement village um, model. The uh, in year one, sort of under both scenarios, the cash flow it's about the same. Um, you know, we need to sort of find about another twenty five, twenty six thousand dollars out of the superannuation money to um, pay the the bills. Um, but what's uh, significant is at the end of five years, because you've paid more money under that granny flat agreement, which is um, therefore exempt from the social security means testing. Um, in this example, Fatima is actually earning more age pension. So she doesn't have to draw as heavily on the other superannuation um, uh, money. So uh, over the course of sort of five years, there's an, you know, nearly an $82,000 difference there in what Fatima's remaining assets are, which is you know, nearly predominantly just how much extra age pension she's gotten over the five years by paying more money for the granny flat arrangement. Um, so that that's where all those concessions sort of can actually be quite substantial in terms of their impact on income and what that then means for you know, drawing on the other assets. Um, that's pretty much all I sort of had in terms of uh, formal stuff. Uh, I think, as you said, sort of through the group, um, I love nothing more than an interesting question and sort of cases and uh, you know, things like that, particularly where they touch on you know, aged care and um, family arrangements and social security and the like there. So um, uh, I would certainly say to anybody, uh, if you have a, an interesting one and want to sort of throw it around, um, I love getting those phone calls or emails or sort of connect on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, I, I, I will talk about it for far longer than you actually care to hear about it. We have any other sort of questions or comments that were coming through or <laughs> thank you so much for that michael um i'll just let you know i've turned off my webcam because um can you hear me i can hear you yes can you hear me okay there michael i can hear you now I'm just checking, we're having an internet issue and I'm not sure if it's at on Michael's end. Oh, you can. Yeah, we, we just had a bit of buffering there. Um, we had a really great question come in from Jasmine, just about the reverse scenario. So what if the parents, like the children, move into their house and um, the children build a granny flat? For themselves you know does this impact on the social security tax stamp duty issues um so i, I think predominantly in, in most of those scenarios it's probably less frequent that the children in that uh, respect are, are going to be receiving social security benefits so i i, I think yeah I, I can't think that it wouldn't apply um, but probably one of the uh, things is the, the social security benefits outside of the disability support pension. Um, most of the, uh, the other benefits, so things like uh, job uh, seeker and the like there, have very harsh um, asset cutoffs. So rather than sort of getting to a threshold and then you gradually re uh, reduce your entitlement, you sort of just get to that lower threshold and the entitlement is gone. So. Um, I think in theory it could apply, but I would be fairly surprised if you're going to see a lot of those type of arrangements. Uh, yeah, I, I think even just thinking out loud, if, if we had that scenario, you know, a, a younger generation, um, I, I would probably be asking, well, why not just, probably depends if they're building that granny flat, but yeah, why not just actually reside in the property um, 
you know, without sort of transferring any ownership there. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have seen it and where it's like the lame duck of the family, like a spendthrift child or even maybe just a young couple saving for a home who, you know, the family's going, oh, well, why don't we just, you know, put your savings in and build this smaller, um, you know, Airbnb style accommodation on mum and dad's place where, um, you know, just to try to give them somewhere to live and, and the parents are helping them out. And um, I think with, I think in that case it's incredibly problematic with the CGT consequences and all those issues that go into an agreement and extracting capital value, that kind of thing longer term. Yeah, that, that, that's right. I think in that scenario, because they're, they're sort of probably working and things like that, you, yeah, you might not have the social security concerns, uh, but yeah, you've then got, well, how do they actually sort of get that capital back out if they need to leave? And particularly where you might be talking about you know, shorter term arrangements um, mm. like that. Um, and and th this is where that, that actually sounds a lot like something where that CGT event would apply. And I'm not sure that the way that this has been framed through that Board of Taxation report, that whatever exemptions they've sort of come up with that they've said they will, would cover that scenario. So I think there, there is potentially, uh, yeah, that they, they might actually still get caught up in that same yeah. uh, tax issue there. Uh, so can I just confirm, does the Social Security requirements extend to like disability pensions as well or is it just the like age pension? Um, yeah, so, so for the disability support pension, um, it, it is substantially similar to the age pension um, in all of the testing except rather than um, eligibility uh, starting with an age qualifier, uh, it's, it's effectively an ability to, um, you know, a, a measure of uh, level of disability. But once you then start yeah. getting the asset testing works and homes being exempt and things like that, um, it's, it's virtually the same uh, payment in, in a way. The, yeah. Whereas if we look at um, you know, Job Seeker, what use, you know, was recently called New Start Allowance, um, they are substantially different in the way all those assessments uh, sort of take place. Okay. Uh, Tasman, great question. I hope I've um, conveyed that correctly. And if you did want further clarification, um, please let us know. Anthony and Adele are um, chatting in the comments about the estate planning consequences for grannies or nonna. So, um, you know, how do we make sure that nonnas will adjust for this um, contribution into someone else's property and also you know going back to this issue which for me is always a stickler you know the increase in value and extracting that capital value back to the the granny or the nonna I mean I just yeah I definitely think that needs to be done and maybe if the estate's big enough and there's enough to sort of equalize everybody then you know it's not too hard but to me I always think if there's just not a lot of money around and the children who, or the, the you know, the, let's say the children who have the property ownership, if they have to find a way to pay out granny of her capital improvement either or into back into the estate to the other family members or to fund retirement, it just, I, you know, it could be very difficult in a practical sense. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think that time is a big factor in that too because if you imagine uh, our example with uh, Adama for the, the case study who was 68 of entry now and, and yeah, we was there were some large amounts that we were talking about sort of north of five hundred thousand dollars there um, now if something terrible happens and Adama passes away a year into the agreement um, that transfer of five hundred thousand dollars which has you know built the grand fight or bought the bigger house or whatever it is for the kids a lot of that looks like a gift, you know, the, that there's been a substantial increase in the children's assets um, for, for you know, over a very short period of time. Um, now, if Fatima actually stays in that granny flat for 20 years, uh, you probably find that the, the, the children in, in that scenario 
have actually done what, you know, driven to medical appointments, coordinated specialists, all those sorts of things over the years, that it really sort of, it, it doesn't have that same character as a gift as it might sort of in, in that short period. So that's where I think you know, looking at the way that those retirement villages have the sort of deferred exit fees and, and things like that, um, yeah, it is is quite important uh, and it also plays into that sort of family conference of if somebody's going to object to whatever structure you know you and the person has sort of come up with um, you'd really like to know about that before everybody does all the other transactions that follow not six years down the track um you know when yeah, it, it becomes very difficult to unwind i, I certainly um a, there, there, there's a lot of work in the in, in these things, which is uh, good for practitioners, obviously. The um, but there, there's a lot of work because they are really uh, you know interesting issues, and and you know you, you really are sort of blending in with um, you know people's family arrangements and and even um, you know the the, the cultural uh, background that they might bring to that, because largely the Australian social security system. Uh, it really sort of looks at you know, generations of family as quite distinct um, you know, financial entities and responsibilities, um, whereas what are, you know, these granny flat type arrangements are, are really sort of, they're blending that in a way that, um, which might be quite culturally uh, normal uh, for, for, for people. Um, and, you know, it, even if you know, it might be sort of, they might, may have migrated generations ago, but that sort of cultural factor has persisted um yeah you know, whereas the system we have here doesn't i mean this is an improvement in sort of recognizing and facilitating that um, but it, it's still not uh you know widely catered for yeah um and i would say andrew has made an interesting point in terms of this is an area that's just rife for family provision application claims and um, tying back to Jasmine's scenario, especially when the adult children and their partner and kids all move back in. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm just reading your comment, Jasmine. So with the issue of the house and the granny flat passing onto beneficiaries after granny passes away, what happens if there are other children that were not involved? Can they make a claim? Let's assume they had no involvement. Well. They absolutely can make a claim and then it just comes down to understanding and evaluating all of the facts and what was adequate provision and equitable entitlements and but I mean what I always say as soon as you have disgruntled beneficiaries looking at bringing a claim or, or making a claim everybody has lost because it's lawyers at 10 paces and all of the legal fees are starting to erode the a state available for distribution. So I think it's interesting be up front. Yeah, what, what you've touched on there that's interesting though is some of that tra transaction may actually move the assets out of the estate. So, um, and, and I, I know in particular New South Wales has your notional estate provisions and the like there, but um, you might be making a, a family provision claim against an, an estate that doesn't really hold all all of that that wealth anymore too so i think that that would be um yeah re relevant i i think i think you can almost guarantee that um you know if they do get an uptake in sort of more people making these agreements um you know i i don't believe there's any shortage of estate disputes as it is already um but yeah i i, I think you would find that um yeah this this would just yeah it's adding more complexity to people's family and financial arrangements and yeah that's what generates disputes. So. Uh, oh, I mean, just awesome um, comments there, and also sorry from you, Michael, and also from everybody um, contributing. And I think what we've shown is that there's a lot of thought that needs to go into setting this up and advising on them, and you know, an overlay of many different areas of law and expertise and I think yeah it's there's probably not one perfect answer but this is an area that needs a lot of consideration and I think collaboration from different advisors and um, just I'm not going to sort of we could probably spend a whole 
session talking about alternatives, you mentioned earlier, you know, an apartment close by or something to the, the family home to provide that support. That sounds like a great alternative. Were there any others that you commonly see or that you can suggest to people to simplify it? Yeah, so it, it, it may be have the capability and the means of, as I said, rather than doing this as a big capital transaction, um, is actually just a, a rental agreement. Uh, if, if we sort of think about um, you know, our, our case study for um, Fatima here, um, you know, what, what we're saying is that you know, Fatima had, if we ignore all the emergency funds and things like that, $500,000 in super, $650,000 in other financial assets, um, you know, maybe if, if the other sort of arrangements support it, Fatima could just live in the children's house or in a granny flat built on their house and pay them rent for it rather than yeah. handing over half a million dollars. Um, that certainly, uh, once again, that, that probably puts some risks to the other parties, um, but they, they may be the people best positioned to bear those risks. I think that's where we talked about this sort of risk of elder abuse is for the older sort of person uh, going into these agreements you know, there's, there's not much ability to go out and sort of get a loan from somebody uh, you know, else or, you know, go back to work and alter their retirement plans. These things are often pretty fixed by the time they're looking at this. So, um, yeah, that doing it as a rental, there may be some risks for the, the younger generation, but if you weigh everything up, you might say, well, actually, they're the ones who can bear those risks. Um, so it's better to uh, do that uh, for them and, you know, if, if things don't work out, well, Fatima spent some money on rent, uh, but Fatima can take her million dollars and then go and, you know, do whatever works for them, you know, the next stage. Um, and Jasmine has also said, yeah, do you just cop the stamp duty and if you can, you know, transfer a joint title or something like that as well, which is obviously to, I think would depend on the nature of the property and the family arrangement. But... Yeah, I, d I definitely think it's worth while evaluating all the options before just charging down the granny flat path. Yeah, yes, yeah, absolutely. Um. Um, well, thank you everyone for your amazing questions and Michael especially for your generosity today. We have gone over the hour, so I am mindful you've got other things to head off to. Michael, was there anything you wanted to say as your concluding comments before we finish up? Um, no, no, that's uh, that's all. Um, so, yeah, look, hopefully we do sort of start to see as the reform comes through um, more of these agreements and, and then we can... Uh, yeah, start to find out where it all goes. Well, we might have to get you back once we see the um, legislation or have that enacted. Um, thank you, everybody who tuned in live. It is really great to get the live discussion going and some really thoughtful and insightful comments to aid um, to our chat today. So I'm really grateful for that. And everybody, if you're watching this after we're live as well, feel free to throw your questions and comments in and Michael and I will keep the chat a look out for the chat as well. And um, keep answering them as these keep going. Michael, thank you so much for um, sharing your insights today. It's really generous for you to share your knowledge and your time. And um, we'll finish up there. Have a great day, everybody. No worries. See you later.